Story three of the Magic Wand. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Magic Wand by Tudor Jenks. The Boy and Dragon. It was by the merest accident that I happened to read that copy of the Daily Electrizer. A small boy was flying a kite, and it caught in the telephone wire that ran by my window. In trying to disentangle it, I noticed an advertisement headed, Wanted a young man of noble lineage to release a distressed princess who is now held captive by a medium-sized but ferocious dragon. Johnny, I called to the small boy. My name isn't Johnny, he replied, and I don't want to be called Johnny, mister. His hair was red, and he seemed to have a quick temper. I am not a mister, I answered in kindly but dignified tones, and I don't like the title. What is your name, my rosy scalped friend? He looked around for a stone to throw, but the street was paved with Belgian blocks, each weighing about ten pounds, and he made up his mind to be civil. My name's Roderick Adolphus Peterson Stubbs, Jr., he answered, putting on his cap and pulling it down hard. Now what's yours? I am the disinherited Duke of Marable, Count of Mackintosh, I said. <whistles> he whistled. Your name is as bad as mine. Your name is not that bad, I said soothingly. Oh, isn't it? He returned with an up and down stairs inflection. The boys call me Roddy, Reddy, and Raps. What do they call you? They don't call me anything, I replied affably. But what I wanted, Roderick, was to inquire whether I may cut an advertisement out of this newspaper. What's it about? Rare stamps? No, about a princess and a dragon. All right then, cut it out and paste on another piece. But what are you going to do with it? I thought I would rescue the princess from the dragon, and maybe marry her, if she is beautiful, good, economical, and rich, inquired Roderick. Oh, that doesn't matter, I said. I have enough for both. Say, remarked Roderick, after a short pause, lend me a quarter, will you? What for? Jews to our club, he answered. I am the treasurer, you know. And I keep the cash, and there was a circus in town last week. Did you see it? And I am a quarter short. You're very welcome, I answered. So I threw him a quarter, cut out the advertisement, and shut the window. I found, on reading the notice, that the princess had been carried away some three months before, and that she was held in captivity in a cavern upon a lofty mountain peak. I made up my mind that it was a worthy case of genuine distress, well suited to a modern knight-errant's enterprise. I consulted a timetable and found that a train left for her native land at 7.45. I had just about time to pack my valise before the train started. Upon my way to the station, I met Roderick A. P. Stubbs, Jr., who was also carrying a small satchel. Hello, he said. Why, Roderick, where are you going? I asked. I've run away from home, he said with a mournful grin. What for? I asked in astonishment. Because nobody loves me, he replied in a tone of settled despair. How do you know that? I inquired. They sent me away from the table at dinner today, he answered angrily. I saw that it was useless to argue with him in his present frame of mind, and so I asked, where are you going? As far as 67 cents will take me, he answered, and from there I'll walk until I wear out my Sunday shoes. This, Roderick, is all wrong, I said seriously. Let me persuade you to give up this foolish idea. Come with me instead. I will telegraph to your family that you are safe and will be back in two weeks. Then you can come with me and help me to slay this dragon. He seemed moved by my appeal. How do you know, he inquired, that we will be back in two weeks? 
That is the ordinary time," I replied, " for a medium sized dragon. In fact, I have slain them in less." " How do you do it ?" Roderick asked, with curiosity. " Come with me, and you shall see," I suggested, smiling. " It's all right for you," said Roderick, after a moment's reflection, " for you will get the princess and the reward. But what good will that do me ?"" Very true," I replied. " You will deserve some reward also. How would you like a gold plated bicycle ?"" With a bell and a lantern ?" he asked eagerly. " Certainly," I answered, " with all the modern improvements." " I'll do it," he said. We walked along together, and when I came to a telegraph office I sent a dispatch to Mr. and Mrs. Stubbs, informing them that Roderick had agreed to spend two weeks with me on a dragon hunt. Roderick seemed relieved when the message had gone. We caught the train, and, after a pleasant journey, arrived in the land of the captive princess. We went boldly up the front steps of the palace and rang the bell. To the attendant who answered the summons, I explained my errand. He asked me to come in and sit down in the reception room. After a few moments, the king came in. I'm sorry to keep you waiting, he said pleasantly, but I am just back from the funeral of the last dragon fighter. He was the twelfth, so you are the thirteenth. Don't mention it, I said politely. We waited only a moment. Your Majesty, let me introduce my assistant, Mr. Stubbs, Rodolphus Adderick Peterson Stubbs. Well, you have made a mix of it, said Roderick, with indignation. Never mind, said His Majesty. I am happy to meet you, Mr. Stubbs. I hope you will succeed in your work. Thank you, sir, said Roderick. Won't you have some refreshment? was His Majesty's next remark. How is the ice cream today? Roderick asked, with an ease that surprised me. The vanilla is good, answered the king. But the chocolate is a little flat. The vanilla will do very well, said Roderick graciously. So the king rang the bell, ordered a quart and a pint of vanilla, plain, and we discussed the terms of our bargain over the luncheon. Soon we were agreed. It was arranged that I was to slay the dragon in two weeks, or be banished for forty years to a desert island. If I slew him, I was to marry the princess. Roderick was, in case of success, to have his bicycle, in case of failure, to learn by heart all the pieces of verse in the fourth reader. There, said the king, I'm glad it's settled. The princess Amelia Anne is greatly missed at home, and the dragon is a public nuisance. He feeds on rocks, flies over the city at night, rattling his scales, and wakes all the children turns all the milk sour with his roarings, eats the pet swans in the public parks, and altogether makes himself as unpleasant as he can. Why hasn't he been killed? I asked. The dozen who tried it have all failed, his majesty answered with a sigh. He spouts fire, has quills of pure steel like a porcupine, flies like an express train, strikes like a pile driver, has armour of solid iron a foot thick, and is difficult to talk to, as he understands only Arabic. Does he ever fly by day? I asked. Sometimes, but very rarely. Here he comes now, suddenly shrieked the king, getting under the sofa. There was a clatter like that made by a truckload of steel rails being carried over a cobblestone pavement, a dark object whisked by the window and the noise died away in the distance. "'He's gone down to the station to get his mail,' said the king, as he crawled out and dusted his robes. "'Does he get letters?' Roderick asked in amazement. "'Oh, no,' the king answered, smiling politely at the boy's mistake. "'I mean his coat of mail. He makes it out of steel rails. He chews them up, melts them in his fiery jaws, and adds a new coating every week or two. You must excuse me, he went on. I have business to attend to. Farewell, I trust you will succeed. We bowed ourselves out, 
and i went and secured the use of a modest set of apartments during our stay and also leased a boiler factory for two weeks there is no use in disguising the fact i said to my assistant mr stubbs that this is rather a difficult dragon to overcome it is my first experience with a steel-clad dragon and i have been told that they are not easy to manage still i think i see my way clear in this case what are you going to do asked roderick i thought i would make a knight out of iron put a phonograph in him set him up somewhere near the cavern where the princess is make him defy the dragon have him loaded up with dynamite and then when the dragon comes down on him there will be an explosion and away will go night dynamite and all what do you think of my plan it's too much trouble and costs too much said roderick promptly i was hurt the boy was too forward do you think you can do any better i asked irritably why of course i can said roderick and i'll tell you what i'll do you help me the first week and if i don't succeed i'll help you the second week really the boy's self-confidence was amazing i made up my mind to let him have his own way merely to cure him of self-confidence very well i said it shall be as you say all right said roderick the next day by his direction we bought hundreds of bales of cotton batting and engaged a lot of men to make it up in the shape of swans below each swan was fastened a light board about two dozen of these swans were set afloat each day for four or five days strange to say they all disappeared during the night then a terrible roaring was heard from the distant mountain where the dragon dwelt the next night roderick bought a great number of electric lights in glass bulbs and after a consultation with the court interpreter went into the boiler factory and climbed up to its roof he arranged the lights on the roof in a curious pattern and then came home and slept soundly during the next day roderick rigged himself up in a long robe a high hat a large pair of spectacles without glass and a cotton batting wig and beard and when evening came he went to spend the night on the roof of the boiler factory there was a terrible rattle and clatter and roar that night that woke all the children for miles around next morning roderick was nowhere to be found i thought so i said bitterly to myself this comes of letting a foolish boy have his own way evidently the dragon has made mincemeat of that unfortunate roderick adolphus peterson stubbs jr with all his tomfool costumes then i sat down to compose a fitting telegram to the stubbses i had written as far as roderick missing probably dragon has when there was a sound of cheering in the street and i ran to the window i saw roderick dressed in a magnificent court suit three sizes too large for him being escorted to our lodgings by an enthusiastic crowd of citizens they had taken the horses from the royal coach and were drawing him in triumph amid wild cries of stubbs the dragon doctor stubbs forever stubbs the saver of princesses and similar expressions soon he entered the room roderick my dear boy i asked explain the scene will you it's easy enough to explain it said roderick i rescued the princess what you re i rescued the princess he repeated and how did you do it the dragon ate the cotton batting swans yes they made him sick yes i put up a sign in electric lights on top of the factory yes the court interpreter helped me and i put it up in arabic saying dragon doctor then when the dragon read it i fixed myself up like an old doctor and he carried me off to prescribe for him and you prescribed i prescribed an entire change of scene and air i advised and ordered him to go to the north pole i offered to take care of the princess while he was away he went early this morning 
and I brought the princess home before dinner. You did wonderfully well, I said heartily. And was the princess beautiful? I have brought you her photograph. And Roderick drew the portrait from his pocket and handed it to me. I looked at it eagerly and turned to Roderick. Let us go home, I said. All right, he answered. Amelia Anne may be lovely in character, I observed, as we hurried toward the station. But I wonder the dragon ever survived the sight of her face. As we parted at the gate leading to Roderick's house, I said, Farewell, you are young, but in time you'll do good work in dragon slaying. Farewell, said Roderick. Then you'll send the bicycle? I will, I said. Then, as I grasped his hand in parting, I added, Never mind that quarter, you can keep it. But when the dragon gets back from the North Pole, there's going to be trouble. End of story three. End of The Magic Wand.